Hi, I'm Alina. This presentation will be about samurais, for example. What they did, what kind of armor they used, what kind of mask they used, and what kind of weapons they used. Oh yeah, Vega and Angel are in my group too. The samurai, a warrior of pre-modern Japan that later down the line turned into a whole military and the highest social castle ranking in the Edo time period. They were in a sense the protectors of the shogun and the daimyo, the best samurai rank there can be. They were their guard, their bodyguards, if you will. So if you had a bone to pick with the shogun or a daimyo, you had a bone to pick with the samurai. They also gave the shogun and the dynamo more authority over the emperor in addition to more power. They were on the rise until the Meiji Restoration in 1868, where it led to the abolition of the feudal system. But to protect the shogun from the imposters, you know, because like they had laid that they needed, you know, like arm armor, you know, because like protection from like you know like swords and like uh, spears and uh, sh sharp objects. Uh, obj okay, okay. Uh, I think it's time to go for to like the next to topic, because like uh, okay. Hey, it's me again. <laughs> uh, I will be talking about the armor that the samurai would use. The first piece of armor was discovered in the 4th century. Um, it was made of really heavy metal and put together with lace, leather, and silk. This armor was made to be sturdy but also flexible enough for the warriors to move around while they were in battle. But it turned out it was really weak and it could be broken if it was hit hard enough. So since the first piece of armor didn't work, during 1336 through 1573 AD, there were distinct changes in the way samurais fought. This resulted in tremendous defeats at the hands of the Mongols. So armor became more focused on the flexibility via scales, which could be small triangle shapes or bigger rectangle shapes, as you can see in the picture, kind of. <laughs> they also used a type of chest plate that would wrap around the front of the torso and tie in the back. These types of armors were very costly and time consuming to make. So that didn't work either. So since that still didn't work, in 1463 through 1603 AD, it was really brutal and full of social upheaval. The armor became more simple with darker colors and had been more focused on functionality over the look. These had a faster production process but they were less flexible. So in 1603 through 1868 AD, this period was marked by an explosion of art, culture, and literature. So it was full of art and just basically on the look. During this time, samurai warriors now spent more time on embellishment of armor and swords. The armor during this period involved more gold plates, metal alloys, and European materials which have more eye appeal. In 1863 through 1912, the armor then was less focused on complexity and involved more modern materials like paints and just the style overall. This armor was a molded body covered with the coating of coconut husk and or leather then covered with a type of resin for eye appeal, preventing rusting and weather protection to keep it all together. This was the end of samurais due to the European influence and culture. Bye! The samurai mask was created during the Murumachi period and was used as a form of protection when in battle. Not just for protection, but also for other reasons that gave the enemy a sense of fear, a sense of physiological fear. Just picture this. You're in the midst of a war and you're confronted by a samurai with a full-on demon mask. Like, come on, don't tell me you wouldn't be scared at all. Like, come on, man, don't lie. Don't, 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 just don't, don't lie, don't lie. Although not every samurai used the mask, 
or a mask. There are many types of masks that a samurai was able to choose from. Four, in general, classified by the portion of the face that they cover or protect. First off is the hanbo. The oldest of the four models was a mask that protected the wearer's chin and neck at times as going as high as to the cheeks. The menpo, this mask was pretty much an upgraded version of the hanbo created in the Momoyama period, covered, which covered the lower part of the face below the eyes. In addition to covering the chin and the neck, which the hanbo also did. The Soman mask was a full face mask that at times was able to break apart into two or three pieces. This mask was almost never used in the wars, but its sole purpose was for parades and social, social gatherings and occasions. Lastly, there was the Hapuri. This mask covered the whole face apart from the chin, mouth, eyes, and nose. No mo one mask was ever the same. Every mask had their own design, style, and colors. Rese is a form of mempo that was created in Nada and during the Momoyama period. At this time, it was the only kind of mempo mask they ever used. The Okina. This mask, although it looked like somebody's dead grandpa, well, that's all I had going for it. It it just looked like somebody's grandpa. The Tengu Me mask, referred to as Tengu mask, was a samurai mask that had the characteristics of a mythological creature called the Tengus. It had its Tengu speak with the face of it as a way to kill your enemy by pecking their brains out. I'm sadly joking, but it was just a mask inspired by the mythological creature, the Tengu. But many have believed that the ones who wore and bared the Tengu mask were believed to be master swordsmen capable of possessing human beings by forcing them to commit acts of violence. To list the three main types of Tengu, the first was the Hanataka Tengu, the long-nosed Tengu, the Karasu Tengu, the Crow Tengu, which had bird-like faces with long beaks, and the Kona Tengu the weak Tengu. Now it's time for the best part of the whole presentation. My part. My part is going to be, obviously, as you can tell from the background, about samurai swords. The best part. The best thing ever. The best. J just the best thing ever. Many people would think that the samurai only used the katana or some sort of other sword while in combat as depicted in most games movies, anime, drawings, and pictures. Although they would use swords such as the katana, odachi, wakisashi, tanto, nodachi, and tachi, the samurai would also use guns, spears, bows, and arrows, but only for longer range attacks. Uh, today I will only be talking about the main swords that they used, the Gitana, Odachi, Wakisashi, Tanto, Nodachi, and the Tachi. Okay, now to the fun part. Well, not really the fun part, but well, I don't know. But one of the earliest swords that the samurai used was called the Nodachi. Uh, because they were so heavy and like really long, the Nodachi swords were thought to be used by gods during the 5th century. That's like around 500 year AD. But... People believe that it measured close to 100 centimeters and could not have been held by a normal weak human like you. But the Nodachi was huge and was used for taking down horses or enemies on the horses. Like to the Zan Ma Dao of China. I don't know if I said it right. But they were basically just used for like big animals or just to reach people on the animals. Then, about 400 years after the Nodachi was made, the Tachi sword was made. Tachi were the mainstream Japanese swords of the Koto period. I believe that's how it's pronounced, I'm not sure. Uh, Koto meaning old swords, like in the literal sense, just old swords. is the general term used to describe swords made between the years 800 to 1600, even after the 
Mudo Machi period, I believe. I'm not sure. I don't know how to pronounce this. Don't hate on me. The Mudo Machi period is a division of Japanese history running from approximately 1336 to 1573. The period marks the governance of the Murumachi or Ashikaga Shogante, I believe, which was officially established. Okay, now back to my presentation. When katana became the mainstream, Tachi were often worn by high-ranking samurai, so just for show, I believe. It was used on the battlefield before katana was, so it was considered to be older. The word Tachi translates as the soul of Bushi or the soul of samurai. When the katana began to be widely used, the tachi sword became a court sword for ceremonies. Okay, now we're going to talk about the tanto knife. It was made in the 10th century. The tanto knife was an iconic weapon with rich Japanese history, like very rich Japanese history. Like think about a rich person in Japanese, I don't know, has, okay, but yeah, the Tanso knife was an iconic weapon in, with rich Japanese history, has roots that date back as early as the 10th century, that's older than my grandma, while its artistic style and structure has changed since then, its design was as a short sword ideal for stabbing and slashing has remained consistent for the centuries. The tanto is a sword, but is used as a knife. It's like, it's, pr it's pretty small. It's like stabbing people. The blade is single or double edged with a length between 15 and 30 centimeters. Or one Japanese shaku. The tanto was designed primarily as a stabbing weapon, but the edge can be used for slashing as well. <gasps> then... About 400 years later, like after the Tanto Knife was a thing, the popular, amazing, sexy, popular, amazing katana came into the world to bless it. A katana is a Japanese longsword used by samurai warriors. It is the most important sword of the three swords worn by samurai. The three swords are the katana, wakisashi, and tanto. The katana was popular from 14 AD, no, 1400 AD until 1876 AD. When the samurai were abolished as a class, <gasps> okay, the role of the samurai in peacetime declined gradually over this period, but two factors led to the end of the samurai, the urbanization of Japan and the end of isolationism, isolationism. I don't know how to say it. isolationism. <gasps> As more and more Japanese moved to the cities, there were fewer farmers producing the rice needed to feed growing population. Okay, so that's basically why the summer were abolished. Whatever. Okay, so back to my presentation. The katana was primarily used for cutting and intended for use with the two-handed grip. Uh, it is traditionally worn edge up while the practice while the practical martial arts for using the sword for its original purpose are not obsolete, Kenjutsu and Aiyajutsu have turned it into modern martial arts. I don't know if I said those wrong or right. Please don't come for me. Uh, uh, I know, I know. This is taking pretty long. But it's going to be fine, okay? You just got to believe me. Just like, just trust me. Trust me. Okay, so now, the other part of my presentation. 100 years after the katana was made, came the wakisashi sword. Wakisashi have been used as far back as the 15th or 16th century. The wakisashi was used as a backup or aux auxiliary sword. It was also used for close quarters fighting to behead or defeat opponent and sometimes to commit seppuku. Seppoku, sometimes referred at, to as harakiri, is a form of Japanese ritual suicide by disembowelment. Disembowelment is basically you cut your guts and, like, it's pretty gross. It was originally reserved for samurai 
in their code of honor, but was also practiced by other Japanese people during the Shawa period to restore honor for themselves or their family. Lastly, yeah, that's right. I said lastly. I said lastly. Let's go. Yes, we're almost done. Kind of. Not really. Okay. I'm not really good at that. But anyways, lastly, the Odachi sword was one new one news compared to the rest being around 200 years newer than the Wakisashi sword, the Odachi Masayoshi forged by bladesmith Sanke Masayoshi dated 1844 AD. The blade length was 225.43 centimeters long and the tang is 92.41 centimeters long. It's pretty big. Like many traditional Japanese swords, the Odachi was used primarily as a weapon on the battlefield. Samurai warriors would use them to engage opponents, oftentimes performing horizontal slashing or upward cutting strikes. I know, guys. You're going to miss me. Goodbye. And one more thing. <laughs> now, let's look at the Mongol battle between... The samurai in southern Japan and the Mongols. ...of imperial China have been defiled, burned, gutted. Millions of men, women, and children butchered by the Mongols. For unknown reasons, Kublai Khan has decided that Japan should now bend the knee to his empire. Japan's government responds by ignoring his letter. So Sukakuni is first to suffer the consequences. At dawn, a thousand Mongols charge the beach. Samurai are masters of the blade, but they are first and foremost horse archers. The Japanese fight in small, disparate bands of samurai warriors and their followers. They prefer to pick off individual targets at range. This initially works against the Mongols, and Tsushima's defenders cut down many of the oncoming invaders. But Mongol tactics are foreign and overwhelming. Mongol domination has come on the backs of battle-worn nomads trained in horse archery since childhood. They launch synchronized charges in units, raining mass volleys of arrows down on clumps of enemies. When the exhausted enemy herds begin to thin, they charge the gaps and look to finish the battle with axes and swords. Here, the samurai's mastery of both grappling on horseback and unmounted sword warfare becomes crucial. In the melee, one samurai shatters his sword, and a shower of Mongol arrows kill him. The defenders of Tsushima are outnumbered. The bodies of Sukakuni and his followers are left on the beach, and by midday, the Mongol invasion of Tsushima is unstoppable. Local buildings are burned, inhabitants slaughtered. The Mongols do the same to the island of Iki before advancing toward the mainland. The fleet comes into view and drops anchor, revealing the Mongol flair for psychological warfare. Their bows are adorned with female islanders dangling from a rope strung through their palms. An onslaught of Mongol horse archers charge the beach to the tune of signals from gongs and drums. They launch ear-splitting gunpowder bombs, sending Japanese horses staggering backward. Then they swing hooks and other weapons to rip the Japanese from their mounts. The Mongols generally navigate the battlefield wearing versatile light armor and carrying personal shields, while the more heavily armored samurai only use shields as stationary protective walls for their archers. The samurai are relentless sharpshooters. Their counterattacks force some of the Mongols to retreat and regroup. One samurai, Takazaki Suenaga, is eager to make a name for himself. Japanese warriors are compensated by the shogunate government only when they can offer proof of their own exceptional deeds proof which often takes the form of eyewitness accounts or enemy heads. Suenaga has tracked the retreating Mongols to an encampment. One of his followers warns him not to charge, to wait for reinforcements, but Suenaga answers, The way of the bow and arrow is to do what is worthy of reward. Charge! The Mongols let fly a volley of arrows, wounding Suenaga and his three retainers. Suenaga presses on until an arrow drills into his horse and he's thrown to the ground, helpless. Suddenly, a charge of reinforcement storms forward, saving his life. The Mongol counterattack is brutal. The Japanese scatter and retreat inland, while the invaders lay waste to many of the homes and shrines along the coast. And then, they leave. 
There appears to have been a storm prior to their departure. Some accounts claimed it wrecked much of the Mongol fleet, while others state it was simply a fortuitous wind that gave the demoralized Mongol fleet the opportunity to sail back to Korea. The Mongols may have realized they lacked the manpower to occupy southern Japan. Whatever the case, the Mongols are gone. For Japan, it's now time to grieve and rebuild. Oh my, congratulations. You have made it to the end of this documentary about samurai. Now, let's listen to some calming music to let the information dissolve into your brain hole. Now just be quiet, shut up, and listen. What you know about rolling down in the deep? 